Hello, my geeselings. It is Mother Goose back for another episode of Robinson's podcast. This is episode 29. It's Sunday, November 13th in Palo Alto. It's really nice out. I had a really good ruck with Mishka the Beast this morning, and now I'm just enjoying some sits with Pins, who's quite toasty and comfortable. And I actually just had this pint of salt and straw, roasted peach and sage cornbread stuffing, ice cream for breakfast. So the day is going very well so far. And yesterday I recorded a really exciting episode with Professor Christopher Babanich at Stanford here. He studies ancient philosophy. He, and I'm going to read from his bio really quickly. He works on topics in Greek ethics, political theory, psychology, and related issues in epistemology and metaphysics. And he's currently working on a project about the relations between knowledge and action in Plato. But, okay, leaving his bio now. He is a super funny guy. This was the first time that I'd actually really talked to him one-on-one. But he he just cracks me up and we mainly talk about studying ancient philosophy in general and then we also talk some about ancient greek ethics now ethics is something that i never wanted to study and avoided kind of like the plague i remember something i believe it was patricia churchland said this It could have been Patricia Kitcher, but I'm pretty sure it was Patricia Churchland. She said that she never wanted to study ethics because it felt like going to church. And when I heard that she said that, I immediately uh, empathized with it entirely. And maybe it's because I was forced to go to church uh, all the time as a kid that I never wanted to do ethics. But I was thinking about this last night and it occurred to me, you know, there's a reason that people go to church. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of reasons, but one of them is that we really do need to grapple with ethical questions. It's a serious and integral part of being human. And going to church, well, whatever your religious beliefs are, they probably give you some framework for dealing with issues of morality. And since I don't go to church and have been finding myself thinking more and more about what it means to act morally or to be a good person, I'm finding that these questions are not nearly as easy to answer as I might have thought they would be. If we go with the flow we do tend in, as we grow up to get a a sense of what's right and what's wrong. But that is not the same as understanding why that's the case or being to being able to explain your actions or reason about problematic, difficult cases and come to conclusions in a principled way. So as I've been thinking more about that, I've found myself wanting to talk to people who actually know something about it, uh, because I'm very much in the state where I'm thinking about this naively. I don't really have a firm basis of reading on which to draw on, on which to draw. Anyway. That's how I found myself talking to Professor Bobanich about this. But we talk, among other things, about how Chris got into the study of ancient philosophy. The, some of the differences between studying ancient languages and modern languages. Etymology, which I really enjoy. Uh, so we talk about etymology, and he has a, a funny story about the etymology of anaphylaxis. Why ancient ethics is relevant to us today. And I find that to be an interesting case because 
as we discuss in the podcast, modern biologists or psychologists or physicists aren't consulting Aristotle. Uh, to some extent, mathematicians are still consulting Euclid, uh, but not not in a really serious way, even though he was actually still taught uh, in some places, I think through the early 20th century, maybe just the late 19th. But the ethical case seems to be different. And I th one reason that that might be the case is that we haven't changed that much as people. We're still uh, grappling with moral decisions in the same way we were back then, uh, even though we have much more knowledge about scientific fields than uh, people did back then. So we talk about why ancient ethics is relevant today, some of the similarities and dissimilarities between ethics today and of yesteryear. Uh, do we need to know why we act morally? And finally, Chris gives what he considers to be a really strong argument for being vegan. But unfortunately, I made the mistake of not telling Chris beforehand that I wanted to talk to him for like two or three hours. So after an hour, he had to go. But the plus side is that he said he'd be very happy to do another episode. And I think we will do that in the coming couple of weeks. Now, I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoyed recovering, <laughs> recording it. Okay, we'll see if I have answers. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you do. The first, th I, I'll be surprised if you don't have an answer to this question. But how did you come to study ancient philosophy? And I'm particularly curious about this because in a good way, I think of ancient philosophy as the absolute nerdiest of all possible academic disciplines that anybody could get into. So whenever anybody studies it i'm immediately curious about how that how that happened yeah well from the time that i was about uh eight years old i wanted to be a lawyer um so when i got to college i immediately declared uh, a major in political science or as they called it where i went government uh since that was common um and for people going to law school and it was a uh, freshman year uh spring um, and they have a shopping around period. Um, and so I had a list of required courses for the political science major. And one of them was uh, political philosophy, which I had utterly no interest in. I was interested in constitutional law. Um, but I couldn't find any friends around to do, go and do anything interesting with. So I was bored. Uh, and that class was meeting then. Um, so I went to the first lecture. I, I liked that. And and kept going on um, and decided that, quickly decided that um, the way in which people did ancient philosophy and philosophy departments uh, was much more to my liking than the way they did in political science departments or in classics departments. And I took a, then went and did a master's uh, in philosophy at Cambridge. Um, I, since I didn't have as much philosophy background as I'm other grad students. And then after that, I went and did my PhD at Berkeley. And how is it that they're doing ancient philosophy differently in the philosophy departments versus these other areas that you've preferred? Uh, um, I, um, I may get hate email on this, <laughs> um, but and the standard of rigor is just so much higher. Okay. Um, and classicists are incredibly rigorous in philological matters I, and issues about uh, translation um, I, or study of manuscripts, uh, study of linguistic forms. Um, but a, a major shift in history of ancient philosophy took place around, starting around the 1950s and 60s. 
uh, I, up until then, it was primarily done by classicists uh, who were not trained philosophers. Um, and Gregory Vlastos and G.E.L. Owen um, I brought the techniques, topics, um, and methods kind of analytic philosophy to the study of ancient philosophy and just revolutionized the field. Um, and so that's why I preferred it to classics. Uh, and in political science departments, the argumentation wasn't rigorous and neither was the philological <laughs> scholarship. Okay, so not not a fan of uh, the ancient in in that that sphere. Um, no, lots of them tend to be Straussians. I don't know what that means. Uh, followers of Leo Strauss, um, and he held that um, philosophers wrote esoterically, and they had a hidden message below, and the obvious message and of the text. Um, and you more or less have to decode the text in order to, to see what the hidden message is for the elite. Okay. So the, the, the way that ancient came to me, I hadn't taken a class on it until, as I mentioned before, uh, we started recording, um, until I was with Katya Vogt at Columbia, mm -hmm. but I was really interested in English literature and particularly in writing. Uh, well, I wanted to write as well. And I thought the ancient Greeks, what I, as far as I understood, were very serious about rhetoric. So I wanted to, this is a very roundabout way of learning rhetoric, but I, I took a class in ancient Greek and I took, I also took a Latin class and I was surprised by the way that they taught the languages. Cause it's so different from how they teach modern languages and that you were reading passages from Aristotle or Plato or something. Yes. Like I that. always tell people that's an advantage. I, and you should take beginning French, you know, I, one of the first sentences you learn is c'est la plume de Maton. Um, I, my aunt, that's my aunt's pen. Um, I, in ancient Greek, the first sentence I learned was Athanatos hepsuke, deathless is the soul. Okay, yeah, that's um, much cooler. It is much cooler. Uh, and you, you're right. I, I, in some books in, in ancient Greek or Latin have now gone over to the modern approach, which I think is a, a dreadful mistake. Um, but you, you can quickly read um, in real Greek and just amazingly great stuff, particularly in Greek, mm -hmm. I think. Are you also interested in the linguistic aspect? I know you mentioned that the classicists, that's something that they're very focused on. But as an ancient scholar yourself, obviously you're reading Plato or Aristotle in the Greek. But do you also sort of relish in the study of the language itself? Yes. Uh, and indeed, um, I'm, I'm one of the papers I finished over the summer uh, I, was the most philologically intense um, paper I've ever written. Um, I, everyone knows Aristotle wrote the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, but he also wrote a work called the Eudemian Ethics, and which has attracted vastly less attention. And since the Middle Ages, uh, there has been a major scholarly commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics once a decade. Uh, every year, for many years, thousands of pages of, of scholarship are published on the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, almost in its entire history, there have only been four commentaries on the Eugenian Ethics. Okay, interesting. And, and the text depends on uh, it seems um, by around 1100, uh, there may have been just one exemplar left. Um, and our manuscripts are descended from that. And it's not a very good manuscript. And the text of the Demian Ethics is much um, more riddled with errors uh, than most ancient texts. And Terry Irwin, uh, who was one of the great ancient philosophers of the past 50 years, 
after he retired from Oxford, uh, he visits Stanford uh, winter quarter every year. And Terry and I teach a course uh, on Aristotle's ethics. He's writing a major set of commentaries on the ethics. And one of the things we read was uh, the Eudemian ethics. And in the last chapter of the Eudemian ethics, um, I, Aristotle uh, refers to people who have a Spartan-like disposition. Um, and what they think is that the virtues are good, but they're only instrumentally good in order to get you stuff um, like uh, wealth, health, um, secure, security in your possessions, and so on. Um, and in 8.3, Aristotle says that the natural goods, non-ethical goods, can benefit such people. And he even calls them good, agathos, which is his typical word for virtuous. And where the name Agatha comes from. Indeed. <laughs> um, and it, this is in serious tension with... I, his, his views elsewhere, since elsewhere he thinks that in order to be virtuous, you have to value virtue for its own sake. Um, so Terry is writing um, commentaries on the, the Eudemian ethics and Nicomachean ethics and the Magna Moralia, you know, running to thousands of pages. Um, I mean, this is going to be the standard scholarly commentary for the next 100 years at least. Um, so he had the really brilliant idea, um, and looking very carefully at the Greek text of 8.3, and the text says in every edition, every modern edition, uh, and the Spartans are agathoi, good people. I, but that has no manuscript support whatsoever. There are no ancient manuscripts that read agathoi. They all read agrioi wild, fierce, hmm. uh, which gives you a very different meaning um, to the sentence. And Terry right, argued that you know, we should read Agrioi, and this changes how we interpret the text in a couple of other places. We reject the emendations. Uh, and the paper that I wrote was a, an incredibly fine-grained um, discussion of that chapter. Um, it's structure, rhetorical strategies, um, and, and also um, I'm reading German monographs on the handwriting I, of different Aristotelian monographs. That sounds like really fun. <laughs> well, one of the nice things, as you know, well, um, you must have this feeling too, in so far as you do logic. You know, if you're going, if you're arguing about what is right or good, I mean, or whether we can solve the problem of induction or what the problem of induction is, um, and you have to be an unusually confident person uh, to, to be assured that, and you've answered the question fully. Uh, there are no objections that can't be answered, and it's just done. We don't have to think about that anymore. Um, but in logic, uh, you, you can do proofs, and you know the next step. It's either right or it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, in the you know, vast majority relative of to cases, that logic, yes. Uh, but you you can definitively answer. Yeah. And in, that's, that was the nice thing about doing this because there are definitive answers to uh, what grammatical constructions are possible. Mm -hmm. um, and what manuscripts could read, you know, you know th there are some arguments about, about this, but mm -hmm. it's not like the sort of arguments between utilitarians and Kantians. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's just nice to be able to do something like that. Where you, 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 you think you, uh, you, you feel like you can really establish that something is right. Mm -hmm. No, that that's very neat. And you're leading into some of the ethical questions that I wanted to get into uh, more deeply. But before mm -hmm. that, I have one other question about the languages, actually, too. So you, you, you do Latin, you do Greek, you do German. Do you do any other ones? Uh, French. Um, I, I can, I mean, with some help, I can read Italian. Um, 
I'm not good at uh, listening. Okay. Um, yeah, I yeah, it's a very different, different skill up that way. Yeah. But okay, I, I always found that neat. But the question that I had, uh, you said Agathos, and that reminded me of Agatha. And my favorite thing about taking Greek and Latin after the fact, because I don't remember that much of it anymore, is occasionally there will be a moment where I come across a word. So recently I was reading that famous book by E.O. Wilson uh, on insect societies. And then mm -hmm. there was a chapter called Dulosis. And I read that word and I was like, I know exactly what that means because I took Greek and I knew that, okay, doulos is slave. So doulosis is going to be ant slavery. And that was just like an aha moment. That, And there are so many words like that. I mean, I hear vociferous and I remember, okay, vos is Latin for uh, voice and voice. is it Ferox. fair? Ferox is Ferox. is to carry yeah. in Greek. Fair, yeah, yeah. So I was wondering if there are any little like etymological facts that you've come across or discovered in particular from your study of these languages or words that you like or anything that comes to mind of that nature. Well, um, I, our furry daughter. Um, I is allergic to bees and uh, she was one of humans, you know, and can be desensitized. Um, yes, yes. I, but she was one of the very first dogs um, I, to go through the testing and des desensitization. Um, I, we were um, at Washington, in Washington, D.C. at the time and she was stung and had the sh shock-like reaction. Um, and so someone at UC Davis, which was the world's greatest vet hospital, uh, had developed a protocol. So we drove her up to Cornell. Um, and have you ever been allergy tested? Oh, yes, I have. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> you know, they put the little dots on your arm or so on. Yeah. Um, I, when they brought her back out, I, she was surrounded by something like 20 uh, vet students uh, and the consulting vet just because this is, they'd never done this before and they were very excited to see what it was. Uh, but the reaction, what the reaction is called is an is anaphylactic shock. Yeah. Um, anaphylaxis. Uh, ana is in the typical Greek privative. Uh, phylax is um, and the phylakes uh, what is guardians. the privative though? Uh, Anna. No, what does it mean to be a privative? Oh, negative, <laughs> not. Okay. Like um, deprivation. Um, Got it. Yeah. Um, and then Fulox is the word for guardian uh, or guard. Um, they're the second class in Plato's Republic. Um, and so this is called contrary to protection shock. Um, and I got a chance to tell. <laughs> the vets why it was called that well what <laughs> what it meant and why it was called that and from the time of antiquity and it's known that for instance if you take a little bit of arsenic every day and you can take more and more and more without being poisoned you know at some point you get poisoned but mm -hmm. um and exposure increases your tolerance in the anaphylactic reaction I mean, what happens is that the first challenge sensitizes the mast cells. And so the first, let's say if you're allergic to a certain kind of stinging insect, and the first sting isn't that bad. Uh, the second one is the very bad one. And then they, since the cells when sensitized, they, they tend to be bad. And when they discovered this, they were shocked because what they were used to were poisons that, um, and such that exposure increased um, the amount that you could take uh, here, I, it was ana contrary phylaxis to protection, mm -hmm. to the protection that they thought you would have. Yeah, that it, that's a great story. And yeah, you've just confirmed my hypothesis that ancient scholars are like the nerdiest of them all. I'm sure that you really took a lot of pleasure in explaining to the veterinarians what was going on with the Greek there. Yes, um, and a number of uh, 
actually a number of doctors seem to be interested in uh, Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and as it turned out, the, well, the um, Hippocratic Oath. Yes. Um, I, like many academics, um, I, I have OCD, I, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah, I've, I have diagnosed OCD as well. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, it has downsides for your life, but it really can be quite beneficial for your scholarship. Yeah, um, yeah, it definitely is. But I was very fortunate because I went to the OCD clinic at Stanford and the doctor, the eminent uh, faculty member who was in charge of it, um, I had a, a passion interest in ancient philosophy. Um, so hmm, um, cool. I, I got to try a number of off-label treatments for OCD. Okay, well, this is, uh, I guess diverging now a little bit far from the ethics though i promise we will get to it but now you have me a little bit curious um first though could you tilt the camera down a little bit more just again sorry uh great i'm curious how the ocd helps you with your scholarship and what these off-label uh techniques were if if you don't mind sharing otherwise oh, we sure. can move on um well i I, I obsessively return to problems. Um, I, 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 if there's a text that's bothering me, I go back to it again and again. And I start by asking, trying to ask every possible interesting question I can uh, and nail down as much as I can, which means just doing an, investing an immense amount of time and energy um, into uh, the work and being obsessive helps and you, you care about details and if you get a detail wrong it's very painful mm -hmm. um i for me I, the ocd also manifests as anxiety and utterly life-changing um and he did small scale studies with a number of substances um a very high dose of caffeine uh, morphine uh, not high doses of morphine, but uh, morphine. Uh, but the one thing, so I tried a number of these, and he was the only person who had done studies on them. Um, and one was dextroamphetamine. And okay. it's just changed my life. So that sounds, so it's an amphetamine, so it's something like Ritalin or one of these drugs. It, yeah. So you take that at a really high dosage? Uh, uh, not really that high, about 40 milligrams. Okay. Um, but it, it's amazingly helpful. It's also somewhat surprising since I wouldn't have thought that an amphetamine is what you really need if you're anxious. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But, but utterly life changing for me. Cool. Yeah. I, one of the perks of being at Stanford is Stanford, uh, healthcare. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I, if you if your meds aren't working, um, I, I ask your uh, in person about dextroamphetamine, and you can refer him to my psychiatrist. Yeah. Okay, uh, sounds good. All right. Well, this has been a very fun introduction for me. But as far as the more philosophical questions are concerned, a question I was talking to. Uh, Lucas Absel, who's who's from Germany, and he's doing ancient work. Uh, we were talking yesterday about the role that studying ancient philosophy can play in contemporary everyday life. And so my sister is doing a doctor of public health at Berkeley, and she's constantly reminding me that the philosophy of math is not nearly as practical as what she's doing. And the question that I'm, that comes and philosophy to mind, of math is not nearly as practical. <laughs> yeah. There are a few things less practical. Yes. Um, definitely. Classical scholarship among yeah. them. But, um, but so, so contemporary biologists, psychologists, uh, they don't consult Aristotle. Uh, I don't think, contemporary astronomers or astrophysicists consult Ptolemy. Um, mathematicians definitely don't think that much about Plato or Aristotle for that matter. But why 
then is it relevant to us today to study or keep in mind what ancient philosophers were thinking about ethics in particular, if that's different from these other cases? Yeah, I would say two things. Um, and one is I, many things, as you well know, I have been part of philosophy at some point. Newton held the a chair of natural philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, and Thales had a theory of earthquakes. I, if you want to find out why earthquakes are happening, you don't go to somebody in the philosophy department nowadays. What was his theory um, about earthquakes? Uh, uh, subterranean uh, rivers. Um, I, underground water shaking things. Okay. That seems uh, fe- p- plausible. But still, you're not going to go knocking on a philosopher's door for that. Right, right, right. Um, there are fields in which um, I, we have not I succeeded in uh, getting such a, a good hold on in finding answers. Uh, and surely ethics has to be very high up on the list of such topics. Um, and still... Um, basic disagreement I know over whether um, ethics is in some way objective, uh, whether it's intersubjective, whether it's constructed, uh, whether it's just falsehood, um, divergences in uh, the way ancient ethics thinks of things and the way in which modern morality thinks of things. And from the time of Sidgwick, um, people have thought, well, Sidgwick was one of the first to mention the point, but it was forgotten after him. But Elizabeth Anscombe in the famous paper, Modern Moral Philosophy, um, pointed to what she thought were fundamental differences between ethics, ancient ethics, and modern morality. And then also, the other benefit is, it's natural and indeed almost inevitable and to think that your way of setting up the problem is the only possible way of setting up the problem. Yeah. And Definitely. Aristotle, Aristotle psychology is particularly interesting in that respect, since I, when you take a, um, and if you're if you're interested in uh, the, uh, these questions, um, and what do you take um, in modern philosophy departments, philosophy of mind, uh, and even if you're a diehard um, um, a Churchland physicalist. Uh, a, a central issue is mind-body relation. And I, even if you are a diehard physicalist, and you see it as a, a serious, deep and serious challenge trying to explain how we can account for, say, intentionality, I know, or quality, or various other things in truly physicalist terms. Um, and in many ways, the way in which we, we see it, we've still inherited from Descartes, even if you're a physicalist, and the problem was how do we connect the mental, mm-hmm. um, just for Descartes consciousness, um, and with the physical. Interestingly for Aristotle in De Anima on the soul, um, this is not the, a fundamental distinction for him. He has two fundamental distinctions. One is between form and matter. And forms are causally primitive powers. And you need them not just to explain humans, but I, you need them to explain plants, plant growth, reproduction, structure. Empedocles, um, I offered a theory in which, I mean, why do the heads of plants grow up? Well, the Greeks thought there were four elements. And Empedocles says, well, the top, the leaves are primarily fiery. And why do the roots go down? Well, they're primarily earthy and then hmm. move down. And Aristotle complains that uh, if this were true, the plant would simply tear itself apart, couldn't maintain itself. So what you need to invoke is form and to explain structured plant growth. So form matter is one important distinction. I, the other distinction is, which he talks about in Dianema, is between psychic activities that are activities of some bodily part. So seeing okay. is an activity of the eye, for instance. Uh, and psychic in an in, in a important sense. Okay. 
and those that either aren't or may well not be. And this would be the highest kind of thought. I mean, um, a, 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 a philosophical or maybe uh, the highest kind of scientific thought. Uh, that Aristotle thinks might not be and the activity of some bodily organ. Um, but perception yeah. surely is. Um, yeah, that's an easy case because you can just excise an eye and then uh, determine that, right? But now, so... The important, what, what's fascinating is that, and for Aristotle, the distinction between consciousness and matter isn't the important one. It's between form and matter, which isn't coextensive. And since he didn't think plants were conscious, but they have form in addition to matter. And it's not the same as the difference between, and this very high level, high flown theoretical thought and perception. I mean, since perception is surely conscious, and you know, Aristotle also thought it was contentful. Um, so the conscious material distinction just isn't at the center of Aristotle's view. Mm -hmm. Could you explain really quickly what you meant by matter and form not being coextensive? So they point to uh, sort of different things, but... Oh, and that the matter-form distinction isn't the same as the consciousness uh, physical distinction. Okay. And since plants have forms, and anything mm -hmm. that's alive has a form, mm -hmm. um, and, but needn't be conscious. Uh, plants are going to be living but not conscious. Sure. And then something that I don't think you mentioned, but I'm wondering if it's true, is that one reason a, a contemporary biologist might not be interested in Aristotle's physic or Aristotle's biology is just science has changed so much since that time. But and we know vastly more. And, right. you know, and Aristotle's views about this were pioneering at the time in physics 2A. He rejects something that's kind of, sort of, a bit like a theory of evolution. Um, and you know, I teach that in my intro Greek philosophy course. And what I try to convince the students of, which I think is true, I mean, is that although Aristotle was wrong, um, he had much the better of the argument at the time. Hmm. Um, at the time, to think that air, earth, water, and fire and could just by themselves produce like, this immensely complicated structure that reproduces itself it was just fantastic. We had utterly no evidence for that at all. Uh, it was much more reasonable to believe what Aristotle believed, but he was in mm -hmm. fact wrong. But I, I, so I drew up that case though to, to contrast with the ethical case, because even though we know so much more about biology making scientifically speaking his biology somewhat irrelevant we really haven't changed that much as moral characters or human characters uh, living daily life and we're going through the travails of daily life and on the one hand or on both hands uh, they were thinking much more about those things than we do today i think uh, maybe yeah, I'm wrong I, about that. I, I'm deeply interested in both the similarities I'm between modern morality and ancient ethics and the dissimilarities. Um, right. And there really are very interesting and fundamental um, dissimilarities. I'm, to a first approximation, for instance, Sidrick pointed out that the central notion in modern morality is that of duty or obligation or yeah. being bound to do something. Sure. Uh, it's a morality of command. Um, the primary notion in ancient ethics are attractive, uh, the human good, happiness. And okay. I Sidric's, would have thought you would say virtue. Um, virtue is going to be um, justifiable because it conduces to happiness okay. and it's going to be part of what it is to be happy. Is that but, what you were saying earlier about it being sort of instrumentalism about virtues? 
Uh, I that, think you said that, or maybe I just put those words into your mouth. That that I, that that's one. The Epicurus, for instance, had that okay. view. Um, almost uh, the other Greek philosophers thought that uh, being virtuous was part of being happy. But that's an extremely interesting distinction um, I mean, between a morality of obligation, command, requirement, um, and the more attractive notions I mean, in ancient ethics. I don't think that's exactly right, I, but there's something deeply right I mean, about it. Bernard Williams, I mean, one of my favorite moral philosophers of the past 100 years, um, and stresses this in his uh, in wonderful book, uh, Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy, particularly in the, uh, the chapter uh, that has a title that only Bernard would dare to give it, uh, which was Morality, That Peculiar Institution. Hmm. I think I've heard that one. It is a good one. Yes. Uh, and, and so what, though, do you think this difference or this shift between uh, sort of a attractive and a duty bound conception of morality signifies? Um, well, I'm, one thing that's quite interesting um, and is that for the ancients, it's a, a very lively question. Why should I be virtuous? Uh, and they thought it wasn't a mistake to try to answer that. And, and be indeed, before you go any further, uh, mm -hmm. can can you clarify for me if we're using the word uh, virtuous as you and I would just use it in everyday speech, or if virtue means something sort of different back then in this context? Um, well, I, uh, you know, sometimes I find myself in lectures saying, I mean, happiness isn't a good translation of your diamond. Yeah, since most people by happiness today mean. And then I stop for a moment and reflect that, you know, I've been in academics basically since I was 18 without ever venturing outside of it. I don't know what ordinary people think. <laughs> okay. I don't really how they use words. Um, so I, I try not to, I try to make too many assumptions about Well, here, that. here's why I ask. It's just, I was... Recently and courage is going to be a virtue right, for yeah. us and their yeah. moderation, justice. Yes. So that that those are the classic things that I would have considered virtue. But I was recently reading about um, in epistemology, virtue reliabilism, which is unrelated to what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. But uh, cognitive faculties like uh, intellect or something are considered virtues. And that's not quite what I would have uh, thought of as a virtue. Uh, yeah, and virtues are going to be dispositions, relatively stable psychic states. And what a virtue does, um, I, I, there are vir different virtues for different species. And what a virtue does and is make you a good instance of the kind of thing that you are. And it's totally uncontroversial in Greek that the word for virtue is arete. Uh, and humans have virtues, cats have virtues, dogs have virtues, knives have virtues. And yeah, so we are, are definitely using the word virtue differently. Yes. Uh, and the interesting thing is they try to justify it. Um, let me point to two differences here that I think that are somewhat interest, rather interesting. Um I, one is that um, if you start asking, and the question of the value of morality, is it good for you to be moral, fell out of Western philosophy um, and with the rise of the three great Abrahamic religions. Um, you know, not all of them are give you the very crude reason I mean, that you know, God will punish you if you're not moral. Um, God has arranged our nature in such a way that being moral is good for us. I mean, but there's no real possibility that they can come apart. I and mean, because there is omniscient, omnipotent, holy, benevolent God in Orthodox Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so they stopped asking that question. Um, and it only really came back with Nietzsche. Uh, and I, I think because God is dead, uh, and morality is bad for you, it okay. makes us sick, has to be rejected. Um, 
I, so that question that slumbered for a long time uh, and became vital again. Um, the other thing is, um, I, I think Plato has an extremely pessimistic view of the ethical capacities of most people, of non-philosophers. And they can't understand moral truths and they can't bring themselves to act in accordance with ethical truths. Um, and they lack knowledge, which is in itself um, and the most important human faculty. And I argued for this position and for the idea that he changed his mind later in life uh, in my first book. And I begin with a quotation from Jerry Schneewin, Jerome Schneewin, who is I mean, the most distinguished historian of modern moral philosophy. And is a good name. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and he says that and the most important difference between um, Western moral thought and from the 17th century on and that which goes before is that after the 17th century, everybody agrees and that any normal human adult uh, can understand um, the moral uh, laws uh, requirements uh, that apply to her and is capable I mean, of bringing herself to act in accordance with them. Everybody agrees on that, he says. Um, he, in fact, and should have gone back further um, because I think we get this assumption and one powerful place for it, and again, is in the Abrahamic, great Abrahamic religions. And if, if you're going to be punished and for violating law, it seems only fair that you be capable of recognizing it mm -hmm. and that you have some awareness of it as a law. And so there's a very strong push in Judaism and Christianity and Islam. Um, I need to think that any human being, any normal adult human being knows what's required of her uh, and can bring herself to do it. Yet not each and every sect believe that there's so many of them but I, that's the mainstream view and so it has a commitment to moral equality and so again when i lecture the undergraduates i ask them look you know uh you know magnus carlson's really good at chess um uh, i could never be as good as magnus carlson no matter how much i studied uh, i used to play seriously um, study, go to tournaments. And then just before I went to college, I went to this tournament and saw a 12 year old grandmaster. And I realized I'd never be as good as he is now. And so people, some people are better at math than others. Uh, some people are better at mathematics. Uh, I think there's a strong genetic component to that since there are people who are good at math and then the people who are good. Yeah, math. big difference. Um, and music, Mozart. Uh, you know, take an average six-year-old. You can train them to do something, but you can't train them to be Mozart. Um, why should that be true of morality? I, we think that all these significant intellectual differences, um, some of them we think are highly genetically based. Um, we accept this view, um, and Shishnay was right, I think we all accept it. Uh, but if it's an inheritance of Abrahamic religions that we no longer have faith in, why should we accept it? Should we accept it? So I think these are some, some of the questions you can begin to ask by looking at ancient philosophy. Okay, I, and I, wanna, I would like to press further on those questions, but just anecdotally, I'm watching this show on Netflix about Jeffrey Dahmer and this point you've just raised about whether or not uh, we're all sort of, I don't know if you'd want to say, I, maybe it's genetically equipped to be moral. It seems like in certain cases, the answer is no. I mean, if you look at that UT Austin shooter from, I don't know how many years ago it was. I mean, he had a brain tumor that just sort of biologically, mm -hmm. 
or at a physiological level prevented him from acting morally in a certain way. So that's, uh, yeah. And the standard claim is going to be that any yeah. normal human adult, right. And they're going to recognize cases right, right, of right. insanity and so on. Right. Mm-hmm. So but even, what... even, uh, and even, and uh, Par- think of paradise lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, Satan is this enormously compelling romantic figure in the, in the first couple books of Paradise Lost, but he becomes shabbier, um, cruder, more disgusting as the poem moves on. And in book two, you know, he's this heroic rebel against God. Um, I, towards the end, you know, he's peeping in on Adam and Eve having sex, and he's just the voyeur at the window pane. I've uh, mm-hmm. lost a lot of his dignity. I, but in an early speech, he says, you know, I, I know, I know I'm wrong. Um, and you know, I, I know that God has given me the ability to do what's right. Uh, but it's better to um, um, reign in heaven than serve in hell. Um, so even Satan uh, and has this built-in moral awareness, Milton thinks. And mm-hmm. I, I do think this this is a very deep and pervasive assumption in the Abrahamic faiths. And so, and you said earlier that uh, Plato didn't believe, I think it was Plato, that he didn't believe that non-philosophers really had this capacity. Is this because he was not considering it to be a, a built-in faculty the way that we do we might today, but something more about uh, something more learned, I guess, and taught in the academy. Um, I, the I had, of he reason. Had, yeah, he had a theory of uh, innate knowledge, and so in some way, he thinks that all human beings have this knowledge deeply buried in them. Uh, but he, he certainly thinks that, at least in the Phaedo and the Republic and other middle period dialogues. Um, I, what he seems to think is that, um, and he, you know, he also believes in the transmigration of the souls. Uh, Which is? Oh, um, and after death, and you um, are bodiless for a time, but mm. then are reincarnated and into a body okay. and live again on earth, unless you become a really good philosopher and you get to go spend your time with the gods thinking oh, okay. about the platonic ideas. It's a good incentive for being a good philosopher. Yes. Um, and what he seems to think is that for some people, in a given incarnation, there's just nothing you can do to get them and to recollect this knowledge that's buried in the soul. They might be able to do it in another life, uh, but not in this one. Okay. And... What then, or I mean, I guess this is another beginning point, but what do the different or different schools of ancient philosophy or different philosophers tell us about the way that we should act? I mean, I know that that's a very broad question and um, not much for you to go on, but I really just am not familiar with this area at all. And I think one of the most interesting claims that certainly Plato and Aristotle make, uh, this is less true. Um, I'm not true of the ancient skeptics, much less true of the Epicureans, and I think also less true of the Stoics. But for Plato and Aristotle, they emphasize I'm, the tremendous value I know, theoretical knowledge. Uh, and Plato also emphasizes um, I, the need, and if you're going to be a virtuous person, um, that your virtue be articulate, um, that you be able to explain what's virtuous, what isn't virtuous, um, and to have reliable judgments about that, and to understand why virtue is valuable. Um, and that simply being moral out of habit. Um, is I, it real it, morality? No, not fit for human beings. Okay. Hmm. And this is a very interesting but also disturbing thought. And since, you know, when you went to college, 
and think of how many hours of your life you would devote it to acquiring um, well-justified beliefs that you really could give a good justification for and about um, plain figures. You, know, you did high school geometry, right? You know, trigonometry, uh, Euclidean geometry, congruent angles, all that you'd studied in a rigorous way. And how much time had you spent rigorously thinking and about morality? None. I've then. only just started doing it in the past like two or three weeks, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this. Um, the same is true of me. The same is true of almost everyone. But th this should be in some way deeply disturbing. It is. Um, it's very disturbing. I, uh, you know, if you're born in Palo Alto you know, now, uh, you're lucky. And, you know, if you grow up and you just do what the other folks are doing, you know, you'll compost, you'll separate out your trash things. Um, and you'll never have a thought that hasn't been uh, endorsed in a New York Times op-ed or a Boston Review ad. You'll, you'll be morally a nice guy. Um, but if you're just doing it because you're fitting into society, I mean, what would happen if you had been born in Nazi Germany? I mean, if in Nazi Germany or antebellum South or pick other, some other depressing society, um, I, if you would have been you know, gone along with the crowd then and done bad things or had bad attitudes, uh, why should we think that you're really virtuous now? I mean, can it really just be a matter of luck? Yeah, no, that that's such a good question. The the reason that, well, I think the reason that I've been thinking about it so much lately is I, so I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to tell anybody to be a vegetarian, but lately, as I've been eating a lot of meat, I have just sort of been feeling or being a, become aware that I'm feeling that at least to me, it's wrong. And when, when confronted with that thought, I realized that I don't know how to reason around uh, beliefs like this. So I'm, I'm just very curious around about how ancient scholars, uh, any ethicists or philosophers uh, think about these things. Because I realize I, I need to know it if I want to live life as a good person or, or be able to see myself as a good person. Yeah, actually, and um, I, it's, I, I'm, I'm an ethical vegan, and, and, and that's the, the biggest practical impact, or one of the, the two biggest practical impacts that thinking about my ethics has made in my life. Okay, that, that's funny that I didn't know that. It's funny that yes. coincided in that level. Uh, before we go back to the ancient stuff, I, I should just um, I, I I can do this until about four. Um, that's that's fine. That's I, fine. I, if at some point you wanted to do a part two for any, I don't know why you would, but if you do, I I would be happy to do that. Oh, I'd but love I to do, do a part to two. Leave it about four. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but well, then I guess for the last four minutes or so, I'd be curious to hear about how you, in particular, went down this vegetarian vegan route or what happened ethically that made you uh, make well for decision. about a year i'd been convinced by the arguments um but i still like meat with a bad conscience um i think one of the most compelling arguments um is i most people um i draw a line in between all humans on the one hand and all non-human animals on the other, say, with regard to lab experimentation I mean, or, let's take, eating. Um, and there might be a couple cute animals that people feel queasy about eating or maybe um, dolphins or gorillas. Um, but most people think all non-humans are edible. And humans aren't edible. Um, can you find any non-trivial 
way of drawing that distinction, distinguishing humans from all non-human animals, that justifies this edible, non-edible distinction, which is a fairly important distinction. Um, and the problem is if you go high, uh, you, you can pick things that only humans, as far as we know, can do. Prove Girdle's theorem. Um, you know, I'm sad to say, but your cat, no matter how slowly you try to explain the notion of a Girdle number to your cat, just never going to get it. Um, I've tried hours. Yeah, I, and I TA'd at Berkeley, uh, and that's where I did my PhD. And if you require being able to um, understand high-level logic uh, as a requirement of non-edibility, there are going to be a lot of undergrads out there who are what's for dinner. Um, if you go high and you lose a number of people, and, or uh, my mother, uh, who about 10 years ago died of Alzheimer's, um, you know, at the end, you know, no longer capable of speaking English, speaking the language, recognizing people and so on. But it, it seemed to be a very unfortunate consequence of a moral view I mean, to hold that she then became edible. I mean, that, that's not a position that I want to embrace because that's attractive. Um, so, so go low consciousness, belief. There are really good arguments for lots and lots of animals uh, being conscious uh, and, and also for having beliefs of some sort. Um, so it's that impossibility of distinguishing, uh, finding something that's relevant, that, that does separate the two groups and is morally relevant. And it's obviously question begging to say, well, I, the humans are human. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that's just patently question begging. Okay. Well, uh, that was very informative. I've definitely had those thoughts myself. Uh, it's four now. So, okay. Uh, thank oh, and you so much. You get, yep. Sorry. You can add this no, last, you can add this last bit out, but I, just as I have you, wasn't that incredible at Prontal? Uh, saying, uh, that, you know, like Christop is an idiot. You know, he picks those, those, these indemonstrable things, things that seem obviously true. I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> how could how could how could you think that you should have um, axioms that seem probably false? recorded this about 10 times because I'm just so bad at asking for help. But if you could like, subscribe, comment on whatever medium you're consuming this nascent fledgling podcast on, that would be so helpful because the best thing for helping me grow this podcast at this point is making it at least appear that I have an audience. So thank you for listening and thank you for supporting me.